Okay, hi everyone. Um, we're gonna get started. For those of you who just entered, feel free to put yourself on mute and we'll have time for questions at the end. Darlene Fukuji here from the Entrepreneurship Center. Um, tonight is a collaboration between the Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship and Information Systems and Business Analytics, short for ISBA, um, both housed in the College of Business Administration at LMU. This is the beginning of a series of events where we cover sub subtopics on the future of technology. And today we'll be discussing blockchain. I'd like to invite to the stage our Dean of our College of Business, Dean Dale Smith. She has been our number one supporter and is our fearless leader. Take it away, Dale. Thanks, Darlene. Appreciate being here. And I'm just so excited that both the Entrepreneurship Center as well as our ISBA department uh, collaborated on this. You know, one of the things we were talking about as I got to know the panelists was the very the, the importance of staying just in time. Um, that no matter how uh, up to date a college of business could be, the business landscape changes so fast. Everybody's trying to keep up. And one of the ways we do that is with value added programming, such as this program, which introduces that technology that you'll need to know. It doesn't mean everybody in this room needs to be an expert on blockchain, but you don't want to be the one reading the business press and then sitting in a meeting where folks are talking about blockchain and NFTs. And you're saying, oh, is that a thing? How does that make sense? What do I need to know? And I can tell you when I was looking, and I'm kind of an art collector. So one of the things I was looking at is I was reading all of these things on NFT and I'm thinking, okay, clearly I invested in the wrong picture on my wall, but it made me th start to think, why is learning about new technology so critical no matter what you're- She's the dean of CBA, which is College of Business Administration. So anyway, um, on behalf of the college, it's my here? absolute pleasure to welcome Daniela. Thank you. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our panelists here. I look forward to being a learner today because I know that the little I know about blockchain doesn't begin to capture the expertise of this amazing panel. And as we all work together to keep up with the business changes on the landscape, we'll all end up being much more better educated. So with that, I'll turn it back to our conference organizers who are going to introduce the panelists. Awesome, thank you, Del Dean Dale Smith. Um, before we start, I want to call up um, ISB Director, Dr. Colasil to say a few words on behalf of his department. Thank you, thank you, Darlene. Once again, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to the panelists for giving us this incredible opportunity to learn. Um, as uh, you know, we are talking about in the uh, in the pre-meeting that I really do not know much about blockchain, even though I have an engineering background and everything. And I, I agree with Dale that you know this is you know how do you learn so fast, and how do you how do you end up actually understanding these materials, and then. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and I think these are the kind of places, these are the kind of things. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to work with the entrepreneurship um, program. That's because I think, you know, the ISBA, information systems by its nature is interdisciplinary. And I think we are seeing that. I mean, blockchain, which used to be okay, uh, people talk about Bitcoin, people talk about finance, but now blockchain is everywhere. Now blockchain is kind of, you know, driving the supply chain. Blockchain is driving, you know, yes, the finance blockchain is driving maybe the art collection and the authentication of what Dale Smith, you know, or Dean Smith is doing. So all of these interdisciplinary things and the opportunities that are popping up. And we are so excited that, you know, I, I, I hope that this is our first step in that long journey that, you know, that's eventually going to happen. And, and this, you know, this opportunity to learn and keep up with it and keep engaging with, with the overall community and with panelists like you. And um, thank you. And I want to thank once again, entrepreneurships, David, thank you, Darlene, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Seal. Um, next up, I would like to call up Dr. David Choi from the Entrepreneurship Center, our director. I'll make this very short. Um, I'm David Choi, professor of entrepreneurship and director of the Fred Keithman Center for Entrepreneurship. I wanna thank everyone, thank Anna, uh, for heading this up, I want to thank Kala uh, and Darlene, and of course, uh, Dean Del Smith and everyone who's been involved with this. 
I want to thank the speakers for coming and I look forward to uh, hearing them speak. Um, I love ISPA. You know, my background is in that kind of stuff, industrial engineering and operations research. And uh, I'm very excited that we're working together on something uh, so exciting. I remember when I was uh, lecturing about a year ago, virtually uh, to Korea, I realized uh, the whole country was going to utilize blockchain to create uh, IDs for everybody. So national identification. So, uh, you know, I think it's uh, some, some places, some aspects of blockchain is a little bit more advanced uh, than the, in the US. Um, I'm glad that any, many of our students have joined. Uh, I see some of our, my colleagues. I see Professor Ray Toll <laughs> from Computer Science who's also joined us. Uh, and I look forward to learning uh, about this incredible uh, future of blockchain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here is your agenda for this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, actually, I'm going to introduce our moderator um, and partner in crime in this um, event tonight, Dr. Vandana, also known as Anna Mangdell. She is a clinical associate professor in ISBA at the College of Business at LMU. And her academic experience includes working at UCLA, Anderson School of Management, Pepperdine, and Wisconsin School of Business. She's on the cutting edge of technology and is dedicated to bringing both her industry and academic experience to the classroom. Dr. Mangel, um, industry expertise includes consulting at Intel, Tata Group, and AE Business Solutions. She's the newest addition to our faculty, and we're thrilled that she'll be moderating the panel for tonight and also introducing these four panelists that you see on the screen. Anna, do you, are you on mute? Okay. Thank you, Dali. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And the, uh, I join everybody here to, to welcome everybody who's attending this evening's uh, conversation, this evening's discussion. Uh, and I join Dali in welcoming our panelists. Uh, I am going to start out with a brief introduction of the topic. Uh, and after that, we will go into a structured discussion with our panelists, um, uh, try and find out everything they know, their experiences about blockchain. And uh, after that, at about 5.45, we will open it up for Q&A. So, uh, uh, Darlene, should they be posting the questions in the chat? Uh, is that how you're going to be monitoring it? Yeah. Um that and a combination of during Q&A time, people can unmute or use the raise the hand feature. Okay. All right. So, so with that, uh, really a very, very brief introduction to blockchain because we have esteemed panelists here, and then we'll go into an introduction of the panelists. Uh, so we are all familiar with the internet. We all use the internet on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. In, in fact, it's become the backbone of how we work and how we live our lifestyle today. Uh, in brief, internet facilitates the digital flow of information. How is blockchain different? It facilitates the digital exchange of units of value. What could these units be? They could be currencies. We've heard of Bitcoin. They could be land titles. As another example, they could be votes. Uh, they, these can all be tokenized, stored, and exchanged on a blockchain network. So we'll, of course, be hearing much more about this. Uh, today's transactions, the way we conduct transactions, if I need to transfer some money from here, my from my bank, Wells Fargo, and I want to tra transfer it to Darlene, or I want to use Western Union to transfer it to another country uh, across the world, to different countries across the world, I have to go through a process. There are financial institutions that are intermediaries. 
um, and in in uh, to, that that is today's process. What we are moving towards with the use of blockchain is removing these intermediaries, removing intermediaries such as financial institutions and even government entities who are intermediaries for land titles, and with with the removal of these. Uh, the, the process can be more streamlined because right now the, the process that's set out for us, the, that is set up for us, it has its issues. It can be hacked into, it creates inequities. If you're working with financial institutions, uh, we, have, we are creating inequities when there are people who do not have the ability of creating bank accounts. It slows things down. There's a process to follow there's always a charge, so it can become expensive. Because of all of these, uh, there is incentives for us to be moving in the direction of using a technology called blockchain. As Heidi brought it up, Satoshi, uh, Satoshi Aizit, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with a protocol uh, that allows peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfers and uses strict cryptography for transferring uh, value, for transferring units of value. So essentially blockchain does two things. Is It's a distributed software network that does two things. One is it maintains a digital ledger. It maintains a permanent record of a transaction. Uh, which cannot be debated. That's one. The second part is it, it is a mechanism that, that is enabling the secure transfer of assets without an intermediary. So it, it, has, it plays this dual role uh, in terms of being able to function. Uh, so I will leave you with that. Uh, all I want to say before I uh, move ahead to introduce our panelists is that it holds great promise to solve day-to-day -day problems, such as the ones that we talked about, such as financial transactions and land titles, but it, it, it can also help us solve bigger problems, major problems such as uh, poverty, uh, such as sustainability, and we are going to be talking about some of those uh, during our discussion today. So with that, uh, I'd like to move um, into our uh, Q&A session, and we'll start out by inviting each of the panelists to introduce themselves. We can start with Heidi Pease. Hi there. Thank you so much, Dr. Mangal, and for the entire LMU staff. Um, it's an honor to be here talking about my favorite subject, <laughs> blockchain, which is ever-changing. Um, so my name is Heidi Peace. I am the co-founder of the Los Angeles Blockchain Lab, which is a, an organization of government, businesses, and academia in Southern California focused on building a thriving ecosystem, a blockchain ecosystem in SoCal. And basically, I got started in blockchain. I don't have an engineering background. And I mention this because I think it's important that people hear that you don't need to have an engineering background to become very involved or to have a career in blockchain. Um, when I first started, I wasn't in, I didn't even have a Facebook account. So I really wasn't part of technology that much at all. Uh, but I did come from the traditional financial world. I worked for AIG for many, many years. And I left AIG about 10 days before uh, AIG crashed during the 2008 recession. And when I was there, I noticed how data was transferred from um, many of these businesses and the data was often incorrect, outdated. It was definitely not transparent. And there was a lot of manipulation behind the scenes. Uh, of this data. And um, so I ended up after grad school co-founding my own startup that dealt with the primary and secondary mortgage industry. And we wanted to solve some of those problems that I just mentioned. And somebody said, oh, have you heard about blockchain? Because that's what the technology is aiming to solve, immutability, transparency, real-time access, et cetera. And this was at the end of 2016. 
it took me a while to read through blockchain materials because most of it was written for engineers by engineers. And uh, so it was intimidating at first. It took me a while. But once I got it, you know, we, we call it going down the rabbit hole. And then there's that aha moment that just the light bulb turns on and you can never go back. <laughs> um, even if you want to, you can't. Um, and I realized this is so much bigger than just financial systems. This can change the world. And it really struck a chord in my heart uh, for a personal reason, because I come from an extremely poor family. We were welfare poor. Sometimes we didn't even have food to eat. And I was, as a result, um, outside in many ways of the normal society. How do I access education? How do I access certain things? It was very, very difficult. And I was, as I was learning more about blockchain, I realized this is something that can change. It's transformative. It can change the world. Um, so long story short, I went back to UCLA and I said, let's start. I met with some professors and we started blockchain at UCLA, which then rolled out to be LA Blockchain Lab. And my, my sort of claim to fame, I guess, is that a few months after I was invited by Richard Branson to go to his private island, Necker Island, and um, talk about all things blockchain. And um, there were 40 people there, five billionaires, two prime ministers, an astronaut, and then me. <laughs> Um, I still don't know to this day why I got invited, but it really did change my life. I've had an opportunity to speak about blockchain all around the world, from the World Economic Forum to the United Nations General Assembly. Um, so I have a deep-seated passion, and I'm super excited that you're all here and that I can share some of that passion with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Heidi. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Lena Martin. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So my name is Lana Martin, and I'm the founder and director of Blockchain at Pepperdine, and I teach blockchain business applications and analytics at the Pepperdine Business School. I'm also the CEO of a blockchain consulting company in Malibu, California. I'm also an entrepreneur, investor, mentor of uh, many tech startups. I also publish and speak on topics of women in leadership and women in tech, and I'm a blockchain advisor and director of uh, several boards, including the International Blockchain Real Estate Association. Uh, I also just wanted to provide you all with a high level view of the Blockchain of Pepperdine program started in early 2019, uh, actually started as a grant from our then president of the university. And it's an inclusive and interdisciplinary initiative. It's designed for advancing blockchain studies and solutions worldwide. It, it has sophisticated uh, team of academic and industry advisors and partners and two uh, core components. One is a research lab for white papers and blockchain development. And the second is a center for blockchain certificates, courses, conferences, and consulting, both internal and external to Pepperdine. So today, Blockchain at Pepperdine has developed multiple conferences, live and virtual, uh, several courses in the master's program, executive professional certificates, and 11 white papers with uh, six in progress. So including numerous collaboration events and endeavors. So it's really exciting uh, and I'm excited to see for the year ahead and what's to come. I just want to give a quick background too about how I first uh, was exposed to blockchain. Um, and it happened while working cybersecurity and communications, but it was at a biopharmaceutical company, so blockchain for healthcare. And then my consulting company started working with one of the first public companies in the blockchain space. So that was my moment of falling down the rabbit hole. Um, all of a sudden, the core values of blockchain started to align with actually the core values um, that I was looking at my doctoral research. And it was primarily the values of truth and freedom. Actually, I look a lot at the Nordic cultures, I'm half Norwegian, and there's a saying of uh, the two pillars of society are actually truth and freedom. And this speaks back to blockchain's decentralization. So it's really important because blockchain offers more opportunities and resources for individuals worldwide. That's really how I came to fall in love with it. So knowing blockchain is the future, I just wanted to help bring this knowledge to the masses. So education engagement is key. And that's when I started the Blockchain at Pepperdine program, started working 
working on providing that blockchain layer to existing entrepreneurial and enterprise projects. But it starts with education and knowledge is the key to that, to truth and freedom. And thank you again for having me here today. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Lena. Next we have Josh Garcia. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be brief. I, I don't expect you to really remember any of my background, but I, I think it might be helpful to tell you how I, I might be useful to you. Um, I'm an attorney, so I've been practicing in the crypto space for about seven years, and I also teach a class at Michigan Law School, um, so I'm an educator. I'm an adjunct professor there. Um, and so uh, to the extent that you all have questions on the industry and how it's evolved, uh, in the past better better half of a decade, um, you should ask those to the extent you're interested in, you know, how someone with a background in like creative writing and psychology has gotten into crypto, you should ask that. Um, the space is, is vast and it's, it's big enough for people from really any discipline to get involved in it. Um, and, and I think if you're going to do it, you should ask yourself why you're doing it. I think a lot of the times people get into it because there's money in it. Um, and so if you're, if that's your angle, then try to, you know, use me and, and the other panelists here to ask, how is there money in it? Where does that flow? Where does it go? And how can I be a part of that flow? Um, so just putting out there my background, think of the questions that you might have and make use of us while we're here. Thank you, Josh. And next we have Nina Nichols. Hi, everybody. Nina Nichols. Sorry about that delay there. Delighted to be here. I really appreciate um, the invitation from LMU and uh, the School of Business and Entrepreneurship. I'm excited that entrepreneurship is being included with blockchain. Um, I think that it's uh, very applicable because I think there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in, in the blockchain space. Um, Speaking of, <laughs> I, um, I did provide this as a, as a brief, just sort of background on, on who I am. I am the uh, founder of Global Women in Blockchain, which was founded three, maybe four years ago. Time does fly quickly. Uh, and I did that to bring women into the space so that they would feel comfortable being in what seemed to be a, a male dominated um, learning space um, and somewhat working space. So I wanted to be sure that women were brought into the space and not, not left behind. Um, but my entire background and career has really been uh, one of entrepreneurship, really even since college where I worked at the college newspapers and did different things on the, on the side. Um, I founded Resolution Research and Marketing uh, over 25 years ago. So we do a lot of market research and it's always a learning experience when we do market research, no matter what the topic. Um, so I think that that has broadened my interest in like, all, kinds of, all kinds of topics um, because when you learn something, um, you know, something new, it really in, engages you to become more involved, I think. And so I think that's one good thing about holding these sorts of uh, forums where everybody has a chance to learn and understand and see different uh, aspects and, and diversity. Um, at the bottom of the screen there, uh, paidstudies.com and the medical panel, they are um, panels that I formed for persons to join, uh, to join a panel and then participate in paid research studies. Uh, so that we can more rapidly reach out to folks who are, uh, you know, of a certain demographic profile and have them engage with us. Um, by chance, we happen to do a lot of research in the higher education arena. Um, and it's, I'm always watching to see what universities uh, are doing and other, other institutions are doing as far as education goes. Um, for a long time, we were focused on what's happening in the online space. Um, with many, many universities and then with COVID forcing everything online like this, um, it's really helped to, I think, expand and accelerate the adoption of some sorts of technology. And I'm hoping that blockchain will be one of them. Uh, a couple other companies that I have are a part of down there. One is um, 
it's called eat certified or education and, and training certified it's an it is an online technology platform and then also global women in blockchain um, is offering and seem to be we're receiving our um, one of our well our first grant um, so we're very excited about that and we have another one uh, on the way but it's it's a um, chance for us to really share the knowledge and to make sure that not only do we connect uh, women um, and not just women, but it's primarily women, um, but connect and educate. Uh, so that's one of our main um, ideas. And then one last thing I might say that Anna mentioned earlier uh, when we were chatting is that uh, she said, you know, it's blockchain, it's kind of how to keep up and being the marketer that I am and like to be, I thought that's, that's, that's a very interesting uh, slogan and explanation of blockchain, it's how to keep up. So there's so many opportunities and uh, it, this goes across absolutely every single industry that there is. So I'm um, excited for the discussion. And again, thank you all and delighted to be here. Thank you, Naina. So, so I, you, you got us started onto our next topic, which is uh, the while blockchain started out in fintech with cryptocurrencies and really Bitcoin, uh, it, it's spread, it's being used across various sectors. And uh, when we had talked about earlier, each of you are uh, looking at blockchain in a different sector from art to legal and financial to solving even big goals like social impact and poverty and inequities. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you if you'd share your use cases in uh, what you have come across in your area of practice. Would Naina, you, would you like to sure. start? Sure. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, I'd like to say that I have um, have a use case in market research, but I do not. But that is one thing that I, I really am working on and we are looking at so that um, with one thing with market research, when you conduct online studies, you have to rely upon whatever the person tells you, you know, that their age or you name it. Um, their background, their education, we have to rely on whatever the person tells us. So ideally, we're looking to try and find an um, identity that would, would provide uh, us information about the person and that validates their information just as when in education, you know, when you, when you graduate and have your transcript on LinkedIn, a person, they can really put whatever they want. You know, there's no checking or validating um, that the person did indeed graduate from LMU or wherever uh, it may be. So, I think that's um, a use case that I'm hoping for. Um, one actual use cases that I am seeing, I'm on a few different um, boards and one of them is a um, group that does vaccines, that does um, vaccine validation. And they're really starting in uh, Lesotho in South Africa, uh, but where it's at the point of origination that it actually goes onto the app. So then when a person travels, I could say, here's you know, here's my vaccination, if you have to show that you've been vaccinated. Um, and but many other medical uh, aspects are, are out there as far as tracking, like clinical trials, another example in research. There's so many clinical trials out there that if we could compile them all and, and look at all the research that's been done over the years in a specific vertical, we would have so much more information. So, um, I just think blockchain brings so much to the to the field uh, of advancement in, in, in every vertical. Thank you, Naina. Josh? So it's not so much uh, happening in the world of law uh, with respect to how blockchain is being used um, on, a, on a practical kind of day to day. There's projects now, um, a lot of them open source with respect to um, creating on-chain contracts that can be um, uh, the kind of settlement happen on chain. Um, it's important when you look at those things to look at the word smart contract and separate it from a legal contract. Smart contract, it typically means, um, you can think of a smart contract like a vending machine. You put a coin in, the, the function goes, and then you spit out the, the thing that you want to drink. 
Um, but, but contracts don't work like that. You, you don't have a contract when you put a coin into a vending machine. You have an expectation that something's gonna work something a certain way, but it's not the same thing. Um, legal contracts have an offer, they have, an accept, they have acceptance, they have uh, settlement terms, they have uh, arbitration provisions. They're a lot more complex than what might be a, they're complex in a different kind of way from smart contracts. But attorneys right now are trying to work on um, making smart contracts that have a lot of the features of legal contracts. There's a number of those projects out there. Um, a lot of the innovation that I'm seeing in, in use cases are more what my clients are doing, not so much what lawyers are doing. And they, they run the gamut. They're really all over the place. And uh, it's in the field of gaming, um, some cool stuff happening in gaming and some, some crazy universal basic income experiments uh, client is working on. Um, a lot of the, the art world stuff that's happening with NFTs um, is falling in, into my lap these days. And it's just all, it's all fun. I mean, we'll talk more about it, but it's not lawyers, it's other people. Thank you, Josh. Lena? Sure. Um, so it's important to know too that a lot of the use cases can be applied across various industries. So once you land sort of some of the examples, then you can start having fun and applying it. So I usually like, before I get into this kind of discussion, I like to also revisit again, the core values of blockchain. So one quote I like to share as one congressman uh, stated is that it enables more efficiency, effectiveness and accountability. And as the thought leaders, Don and Alex Tapscott also say, it will revolutionize money business in the world because it will actually record and secure everything of value and importance to humankind. And that again, speaks back to all the different types of digital assets that are in, in existence, not just our records, but voting rights, collectibles and art. I know Heidi can speak more to that, our digital identities. Um, so yes, there's the cryptocurrencies and the currency side of it, or as they like to call it, digital gold, because it's really labeled as a commodity. But there's also all these other resources and use cases. So in my world, I visit a lot with social impact, blockchain for social impact, as well as blockchain for education. Just real quick, what it's doing in the space of education as a business, it's doing a lot with data management, uh, credentialing. I think we all uh, know about how we need to um, stop any kind of, you know, scams with student credentialing. It's also um, aiding financial aid, as well as curriculum development and ensuring intellectual property. Um, so this enables a more collaborative workspace too, because we can actually document and timestamp anyone's IP and, and therefore be a little more open with our ideas and, and our research. Um, in terms of social impact, it's doing a lot to help like eradicate global poverty. It's doing things in um, as well as uh, aiding against human trafficking. Uh, one example that I like to speak to because it's a, a project I'm currently advising on, it's you've got the infrastructure side of blockchain and enabling more security and things, but then you've got this whole other world called tokenomics or incentivization, let's call it. And what we've done, this is a healthcare app. It's about ready to get launched. Uh, we have sort of a soft launch, but it's in the Apple store. But this is where anyone could call in free um, and talk to a trained listener or get advice to speak with trained professionals. But really what we're doing within the ecosystem, and I always, you know, here's a learning moment with tokens at a very, very high level, you can, yes, think of them as currencies, that can be exchanged, uh, Bitcoin, you know, various ones, or you can think of them as more utility. And in that case, we can treat it more like a, um, it's still incentivization and something to be tracked and think of it like a point system, but it stays within our ecosystem and can't be traded. I know our, our lawyer, <laughs> our advisor, our legal counsel would agree that it's a little more compliance and regulations associated with the securities and the, and the currency side of it. But on the utility side of it, there's some really interesting and creative things happening where we're incentivizing the ecosystem. So for example, anybody who's donating content, anyone who's giving ratings or reviews on within our app can earn uh, points, which can then later equate to maybe discounts on products or to um, donations can then be traded into fiat, but then go outside of the ecosystem to donations. So again, once you really know the actual use cases of it or applications of it, you can get really creative across different industries. Thank you, Lena. Yeah. Heidi? 
I love this question because the world is infinite when it comes to blockchain application. I mean, I'll just echo what all of the other panelists said. Um, there, there's so much potential, not just for crypto, and I'm actually both in crypto, and I also have a startup that helps artists. So, but the, I think where I was most excited about when I first entered the space was the social impact opportunity, as Lena was mentioning. Um, again, because I, my background, I come from a, a very poor background um, and didn't have access to the normal uh, uh, roads to going to college um, or whatever else comes with just financial security. So when I started reading about blockchain and actually, believe it or not, when I went to the Richard Branson event, that whole event was people from around the world that were doing some really exciting things in this space to help move forward communities. So. One of the first things that we discussed was about there are about 2 billion unbanked or underbanked people around the world that don't have access to a traditional bank account. Um, maybe they don't have enough income that they meet the, the threshold entry to get a bank account. So what does that do? It keeps them outside of financial services. It keeps them outside of any kind of internet communities. And blockchain, early on, there were discussions about, okay, how can we make um, um, financial access available to all, not just to those who can have a bank account? And we're now seeing that there's a lot of startups that are working, not just in that particular banking um, area, but things like micro lending or lending that's based upon not necessarily your credit score, but what kind of, have you paid your rent on time or do you pay your phone bill on time? Some really interesting ways of looking at financial services to things like, uh, I think Lena mentioned um, identity. There are hundreds of millions of people around the world that don't have identity, and that keeps them outside of access to social services that a government might offer, education, health care. Um, maybe they were refugees and they don't have that identity with them. So blockchain is being used by uh, and, and being developed by the United Nations. I believe WEF is also working on a program. And then there are other startups as well that are helping with digital identity to things like knowing is the diamond engagement ring that I have, is that a blood diamond or was that sourced from um, fair trade and didn't use child slavery? Um, so any type of industry you can imagine, there is blockchain potential application. And then we get to things that we've never imagined, like NFTs. Uh, and, and actually, that is a space that I'm in right now with my startup. Uh, we early on created a platform to help artists fundraise for their projects and market their projects. And especially since COVID, so many of these artists have found themselves unemployed. And so we early on started looking at, okay, can they start to sell some of their memorabilia to fundraise? And um, so we are also launching an NFT for a couple of artists, some of them well-known. Um, and who would have ever guessed just maybe a year ago that NFTs would have taken off. So we see, I see blockchain not only changing traditional industries, but creating completely brand new ones that uh, I have so much FOMO right now, it just keeps me up at night because I cannot keep up with all of the innovation. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, but that gives us a large number of sectors where, where, uh, where our panelists are already using blockchain. Uh, so I uh, want to keep enough time for Q&A, but I want to ask two more questions. So I'm going to ask two of my panelists, um, one of the questions and, and uh, the other question to the other two. Uh, please, anybody who'd like to, like to add uh, among the panelists, you're welcome to do that. Uh, my first question is uh, that uh, what our students are here and they are trying to figure out 
they if they're interested in getting into blockchain what are the skills that they should be developing so that they are able to get into blockchain so that's one and the second question is where do you see blockchain headed where where is the future of blockchain in the short term in the long term i can i can start um every single problem that has existed with any of the cryptocurrencies that have launched has been iterated on. So people thought Bitcoin was too slow. And so they launched Litecoin, which is a little bit faster. They didn't like that the supply was capped and they wanted to make it even faster and have unlimited supply to have more fun with it. And so you had Dogecoin come out as a result. Um, you couldn't build a Turing complete uh, system on it. And so Ethereum was developed and there's every single limitation that a project comes up against somebody out there in the world takes what's already been done and builds on it. And that's the beauty of open source technology. Um, and so when it comes to, to what, you know, what kind of skill sets you need, I think if you look at something at one of these projects out there and you see an obvious problem with it, just keep in mind that you can try to fix it. Um, and, and I think your skill set may not be technical, but you may rally other people around it, right? You may be able to convince other people that there's a problem here and you can find uh, people to come together and be, you know, sort of like a product manager, so to speak. Um, I don't think skill set matters as much as enthusiasm in, in blockchain and maybe even in open source development in general. Um, so I would encourage you to focus on what excites you about the space where you see obvious problems um, and where something just doesn't strike you. It's like, you're like, oh, why, is, why don't we do things this way instead of this way? Um, if, it's, if it's obvious to you, it's probably you know, worth exploring. So, um, so the, and, and as, you're, as, you're, as that enthusiasm drives you, you'll develop the skill sets, right? You, you'll teach yourself what you need to know. Um, so I would just encourage you to kind of like spot the obvious problems and attack them however you see fit. Thank you, Josh. I might just add for, for students or really anybody who's not in the space, one real learning uh, aspect would be to uh, get your own wallet and set that up because just setting that up takes a minute and that will help you kind of understand a little bit about it. And then, you know, you can put any amount of money, um, you could put $10 if you wanted, um, you know, to buy, into Bitcoin, for example, uh, because it's sold in small increments. So it just helps you. And I think that's a practical experience that you could do and it's kind of fun and it gives you ownership of understanding uh, blockchain. And then anything that you're in and interested in, um, I would look and see if, are there any meetups in your area that focus on that particular subject matter? Uh, we did a ton of meetups in Denver and had really great attendance and a lot of people there and, and different people telling about what they were working on. So when you have more exposure, it just helps you to learn and understand uh, what it is that you want to do. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say the place to start, or I always say, is just start searching blockchain for whatever poverty blockchain for whatever it is you're passionate about because you do need to find that certain thing that gives you that aha moment to really start to understand and connect to what blockchain is ultimately trying to do and i always also encourage folks that i see it sort of in two compartments there's the technical and the non-technical but we need the non-technical people just as much and I always say that sometimes the technology is the easiest part of it in terms of a solution design. It's more about the business processes and the business plans that can sometimes fail us. So we need to know about who's the audience. I often say um, end user or user-centered design is, is a really important thing to learn about or agile methodologies and, and just be iterative with your approaches and just know that, you know, whatever doesn't work, it, you'll try it again. So, so you can come to blockchain in many different ways. It is cross-disciplinary, but it's just important to find that which you're most passionate about. Um, also, 
I, I like the idea of jumping in. So jump in. Of course, this is not financial or investment advice, but get a wallet and start researching, right? Uh, don't put in more than you're willing to lose. Start there. But also, I encourage people as they're starting to learn, read the fine print on things. And I say this because there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to let me back up. Blockchain is all about getting rid of what we call the third party or the middleman, right? We're streamlining processes. We're cutting down costs. We're making things more efficient. We're saving time. But because of that, a lot of our third parties, like banks, when Heidi was talking about the unbanked of the world, they are going to start saying, oh, how can I get on the forefront of this and stay relevant? So then and no offense to PayPal, but read the fine print because PayPal also offers a wallet and an easy way for people to get into crypto, but you're not actually owning that crypto. It's still within the PayPal wallet. So again, do your research, say, but do the research and, and go slow and, and don't, don't do more than your, you know, go at your own pace. Um, the other thing, pay attention to smaller companies too. I know that um, sometimes they're doing great things in blockchain, but again, blockchain is leveling the playing field for everyone. So there's a lot of interesting entrepreneurs doing interesting things in blockchain, a lot of smaller companies doing some very interesting thing. The more you dig in, you realize the smaller companies are actually educating hating the bigger companies. So when you really start to unfold the layers here, you start to really see how this means more opportunities and, and resources for individuals worldwide. That's the exciting thing. The other thing um, that I get excited about, obviously I think blockchain is the future, but we're the ability that because of this, what's often called the truth machine or the trust machine, that's how blockchain is often referred to. Can these technologies that enable more accountability, more truth, more trust, can they actually, what kind of effect will they have on people? Will people more accountable? What, what will be the actual impact on people and, and the behaviors that we have moving forward? It's going to be a really interesting time. And again, it's never too late to get involved. Get involved, learn about it, find that thing that you really connect to. And it's a, it's a great ride. As we say, it's the wild, wild west still, and uh, you can certainly find a place in it. Lena, if anybody was not convinced, I think they, this would convince them, really, your passion shows through. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the wild, wild west. I 100% agree. Um, I think that the World Economic Forum predicts something that by the year 2027, 10% of the world's GDP will be built on, on blockchain, uh, which means that there will be continue to be tremendous opportunities. And, and I think I remember reading a statistic that at the beginning of 2020, before the pandemic, the number one sought after job posting on LinkedIn was for something related to blockchain. Um, I'm still of the opinion that right now, well, we need all types of people in blockchain, whether you come from marketing, legal, business, and engineering. Um, so there's tons of opportunity. I do also encourage anyone out there to look into engineering because we have a global shortage of blockchain engineers. It's near impossible to find a blockchain engineer. Either they are working for a large enterprise, um, making oodles of money, or they've got their own startup. So for the rest of us who have startups, it is challenging to find a blockchain engineer. Um, so I do also encourage really look into that. Um, I see in the future, there's two types of blockchain innovation that I see. One is with existing businesses and enterprises where they're looking to improve some type of system. And then there's also the startup world where they're more often than not trying to displace uh, a system. And if, so you don't have to, you could be either. You could, you don't have to be an entrepreneur 
entrepreneur type to get into blockchain, or if you, if you do see a problem out there you want to solve, great, go for it. For me, I started attending some university forums early on and they were all engineering. <laughs> so about 99% went over my head, but I started to get connected. And I know that the universities in SoCal have those and I should probably wrap up to save time for Q&A, but connect with your universities um, and they've got community events all the time. If you are a student and your university doesn't have a student group, start one. Um, Look for startups because almost all of them are looking for interns. And that interns can mean people that are in school or people that have graduated are no longer in school. And then I recommend for local, there's Blockchain Beach, which is a um, kind of a newspaper that talks about local events. I love the podcast, Laura Shin, called Unchained. And then what we call the Blockchain Bible is um, Alex Tapscott's book, um, The Blockchain Revolution. So those three things were sort of the resources that I started with. Thank you, Heidi. Oh, uh, Coin, Coin Center as a great resource for everyone starting out. Um, maybe ask you to put these in the chat so that uh, people can pick up on that. Oh, for Heidi as well as Josh and, and any of our other panelists. With this, thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to Darlene for the Q&A uh, portion of this. Yeah, I see a lot of great questions already in the um, chat and some of them have been answered. Um, you can also raise your hand, but I think I'm gonna start from the top. Um, you know, what are some good examples of blockchain enhancing equity and sustainability? I know Josh answered, does anyone have anything they want to comment? And don't feel pressure to because we can move on to other questions as well. Yeah, have you, I'm curious actually, have you all seen any like sustainability or equity enhancing projects? I don't see a lot of those. There's, there's a lot of talk about it and they're white papers, but I mean, not not a lot of people use cryptocurrency, right? There's 70 million wallets, uh, like Bitcoin wallets. That's and 7 billion people on the planet. So there's not a lot of us out there <laughs> using this stuff. So I'm curious what, what you all have seen in terms of sustainability equity. I like that question. So actually, there's a lot of projects, um, the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals um, is actually looking at, or they've documented, there's an article, I'll put the link in here, um, that they're aligning what blockchain initiatives are actually starting to support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And there's some very interesting ones. Um, there's also, there's a project I'm working on with um, putting together some kind of fractional ownership or tokenization type of model for um, an environmental develop with the salt and sea. And um, uh, it, so again, there's some interesting creative um, applications happening right now that are backing up every kind of uh, initiative. Um, but, and they're, they're out there. If you start searching for it specifically, um, uh, they, on your search engine, they will, they will pop up, but um, reach out to them as was mentioned, it, they're always looking for people to get involved. So um, it's a great place to start. I'm going to skip over the question of resources because I know that the panelists have done a great job in there. Can someone talk to you some of the challenges you faced, one of them being, you know, talent? Are there any other challenges? And remember, challenges also mean opportunities. So um, I know we've kind of answered a little bit of that, but if there's anything to add. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I would say that for my startup, our number one challenge is finding engineers. Um, it, it's, it's really near impossible. So that's why I'm always encouraging people go into engineering. We need you. We need you. Um, that's number one. Number two, when I first started in this space, personally, it was a challenge because as I mentioned, I don't have a tech background. And 
obviously blockchain is developed by engineers. So the language was very engineering heavy. Um, and it was a challenge at the time. I think that the resources that are available now are more user friendly. Um, but the blockchain community, at least early, when I say early on, it was the 2016, which is not really that early. But at my time, the blockchain community was great at talking to each other and horrible at talking to people outside of the blockchain space. I, I'm hoping that that has improved, but those are probably the two biggest engineers and this barrier to, oh, and I guess the third thing would be that it's still a very sticky ecosystem. Yes, you can set up your wallet, but it's still very, it's not as easy as opening, I mean, getting my bank account. Unfortunately, the systems that are in place are just not quite as streamlined yet. And I think that that's a barrier to entry for new people. But that's a business opportunity. Okay, next question. Um, if no one has anything to add, understanding valuing of virtual assets or NFTs, non-fungible tokens, how do you do that? Can you repeat the first part, understanding the value of NFTs? How do you value virtual assets? Um, well, that might be a good one for Josh to jump in as well. Yeah. That that's a really good question. You know, that that's more of a free market exercise, um, in my opinion, um, because those are for the most part all bidding processes. So an NFT is um sold on a market and there's limited amount of time and it's a bid process. So it creates this the fear of missing out. Um, and it's really based upon what are people willing to pay? I personally think that we are in a bubble, uh, an NFT bubble. I also think that it's primarily sold and transacted within the crypto community. So I think, and I also think that we're headed towards a lot of legal issues. Um, so, but once this sort of crypto bubble bursts, I think that the greater opportunity is for the non-blockchain space. Um, and again, it's like, how do you value something on eBay? It's just really, what are people willing to pay? Um, so I hope I answered your question. Maybe Josh, you might yeah, want to jump in. I have so many thoughts on this. Um, there's so much market manipulation in crypto, tremendous amounts of it. Um, and it can happen offshore. And because it's a global market that operates 24 seven, the offshore market making or market manipulation or wash trading or whatever the hell's going on can ref get reflected in prices in the US. And so how you value virtual assets is a really tough question. Um, because you, it's not, it's, it's sort of like you look at traditional markets and, and you think all the, oh, it just reflects what the true price of the thing should be. And maybe market, market making um, is just price discovery, but a complex form of it. Um, it's just, this is why crypto is fascinating because you ask a very basic question and you have to think about this philosophical point as of what is market manipulation? It, like what is market making and is, is market manipulation bad? Or is it just, like I said, sophisticated form of price discovery? And these are the questions that like professors, I've had with professors at law schools, I've had with other lawyers. Um, but, um, but at the end of the day, the, the question, the answer to the question that people most often settle on is it's like you value them by what other people are willing to pay for it. And, you know, if there's market, make, market manipulation that happens, people are still willing to pay uh, $50,000 for Bitcoin or six, you know, $69 million for, for people, you know, that's the price. So I'm going to jump in here because I, I don't want us to forget though, that the market is already manipulated. So, so what crypto I think is enabling that, it, that we haven't had before is the ability for everyone to participate. That entry, um, that barrier to entry has been somewhat lifted. So it's not to say that there aren't scammers out there or malicious entities. It's not to say that, but as we could see with like the Robin Hood, what happened with Robin Hood, uh, there is that uh, manipulation that's already sort of in place with traditional um, 
uh, set up. So what's what's interesting when when that happened was that I don't know if everybody noticed, but it was an exciting time for us in the crypto and, and blockchain space. Was that finally on mainstream news media channels and things they started to bring in crypto experts. That never really happened before. All of a sudden, crypto people were being looked to as you know voices of of authority or expertise. That was really exciting. So, so it's true that, again, everyone has to do their due diligence. Everyone has to do their research. Um, there, there are certainly pitfalls out there. But I think in terms of overall, as, as more people start to learn about blockchain, learn about NFTs, one interesting um, thing to look up, if you don't already know about it, is what happened in 2017 with CryptoKitties. That was kind of the first use case of NFTs. And really, it was all about the folks at Ethereum were like, how can we really teach people, teach the masses more about what Ethereum is um, as a public blockchain um, used often for, for businesses and things. How can we teach the masses and get them interested? So they created these crypto kitties that were NFTs, a bit of a game, a bit of people were purchasing them. They went for a lot, a lot of money. No one could have really anticipated the interest, but what did it do? It got people to learn about and interested in blockchain and the Ethereum platform. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens and the bad actors will be weeded out. But I, I think it's a, a very exciting time and, and the opportunities are there. So um, it's, it's disrupting, shifting everything we know of um, to be normal right now. And, and that to me is exciting. Great, thank you. Okay, if anyone has any urgent, urgent question, We'll take one last one. You can, if you posted it before, please repost it. But if not, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. They've been so generous with the pre-planning. Um, <laughs> um, it sounds like there, there's some need or desire for um, a club at LMU. So if Steven or a few other people here wanna start it, I think I just um, volunteered them. So if anyone here is interested, maybe direct chat with them. Um, I'll leave the room open for a little while, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you again to the panelists. You guys are amazing. I think we learned so much and just a real great opportunity for our students to hear from such experts and accomplished people in the field. Um, I'm going to put up the QR code for the students to um, make sure that you get credit for being here. And if not, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. I, I remember when a, a professor of mine said, oh, blockchain is a joke. Don't do it. Or crypto, Bitcoin is a joke. Um, and so fascinating to see LMU now doing it. So um, really appreciated the talk. And Stephen, I see your note on Club Clubhouse uh, doing a session there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to set one up. I have uh, a couple of connections in the blockchain and industry and would love to get a, a big group together to chat about it. We have a entrepreneurship clubhouse that we can start one and schedule one as well and invite other co-hosts to it. Totally possible. Sure. Vendana, if, Anna, if you want to link uh, with me, I'd, I'd drop my, my LinkedIn in the chat or we could chat somewhere else about it if you'd like to. Sure. We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll reach out Fantastic. and also uh, work with Darlene on, on the clubhouse. Fantastic. That's cool. And yeah, it wasn't uh, Professor DeMello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again. Um, I don't know if uh, I think David asked a really interesting question. And again, I do not want to take up more time of the panelists, but in case you are still available and you want to continue maybe for a few minutes, uh, I think David's question was, what are some of the cool, uh, right, David, like the really interesting and cool applications of blockchain that you have seen in your experience? But once again, you know, you can say, you know what, it's done, sorry, another time. It's perfectly okay.
There are so many, that's why I hesitate. I don't even know where to start. I would say one of the coolest conversations I have ever had was I got a call from the CEO of JPL. <laughs> this was back in 2017. And he invited me to meet with their heads of engineering to talk about blockchain. And I, <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair because I'm literally talking to the smartest people on the planet. Um, but we continued discussions. They spoke at an event that later on we were co-hosting. And we just had a I guess you want to call it a jam brainstorming session with the engineers at JPL talking about how can we use blockchain for some of their robotics missions. Um, and one of the concern was that a lot of the parts that are used in the robots are built around the world. And as these uh, parts become more smart integrated or the internet of things, there's a concern about, well, what happens when we send something up into space and then the some some item within the robot or the uh, satellite or whatever um, is controlled by a nefarious actor and then that satellite is sent back to the to the earth um, uh, for destructive means and so they were looking thinking about oh well, how can we use blockchain to solve that, but then there were issues about, we're talking outer space. So whatever processes and systems, they have to withstand all types of differences in pressure and heat, and then time, like 10 years, 20 years or so. So they're talking about maybe using slices of diamonds instead of QR codes. And, and these, these slices of diamonds have their own unique identifiers and, and placing blockchains in that. I mean, it was just great. It was. I I felt very smart for a little bit being part of that discussion. I just thought that was really cool. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. This is so, um, yeah, I love all the comments and thank you again, everyone for your time. Um, this was wonderful. Ana, did you wanna say any closing comments? I just wanted to uh, join you and everybody in thanking. Uh, I, I, I think uh, this is a topic that, uh, that, that is of a lot of interest to our community. So I, I see us doing even another session in another format at some point in time. Um, just, just seeing the number of questions, I felt that we had time and our panelists were amazing. So thank you so much. But we, I, I think our community could hear it for much longer than, than we got time for. But uh, we want to let you go and thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much.